Welcome to 650's privacy webinar. We are going to be talking today about the ghosts of privacy past and future. We'll be talking about a lot of different jurisdictions. So uh, stay, stay alert. If there's some that you don't care about as much, just give it a minute and we'll be talking about a new one. Um, I'm joined today by several panelists. Uh, I have with me Austin Smith. Austin uh, has worked on data privacy issues, not just for 650, but also for the US government and at several other law firms. He is a graduate at the University of Virginia Law School and also a foodie. So uh, anytime I'm headed towards the DC area, I ask Austin where to eat. Uh, and then we also have with us William Frescas. William, in addition to his work with 650, uh, was formerly a general counsel for a nonprofit organization. Uh, and so we often rely on his expertise when we're looking at things from that perspective as opposed to from the corporate perspective. Uh, but he also has uh, been an outstanding team member to help us not just with privacy, but also with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, another one of 650's tool sets. And uh, William can be relied upon to always recognize my grammar errors, among other things. Uh, so I'm really happy to have both of them here with me today. And uh, my name is Marie Colbeth. I'm general counsel here at 650. And along with Austin and William, uh, I have helped create our privacy tool sets. So if you're looking at privacy issues in California, Colorado, Virginia, the EU, the UK, or China, one or all of us have had our fingers um, in, the, in the tool sets if you're using the 650 tools. So with that, um, I'm gonna go ahead and we're, we have a few different things that we're gonna address today but we're gonna start by diving in in California. And so I'm gonna start by turning the time over to Austin. Thanks, Marie. Yeah, we can uh, go ahead and for each jurisdiction, as the title suggests, we'll be talking about the past, what happened in 2021, and then the future. So in California, um, the main thing that happened last year um, that's substantive was uh, CCPA enforcement. Um, that obviously has been happening since uh, 2020, uh, but the this last year in July, the uh, California Attorney General released a lot of information about how they've been enforcing the CCPA, which is very interesting for companies who are trying to comply, of course. Um, the gist uh, here, you can read all the details on the slide, but uh, the gist is that the Attorney General sends out a notice to companies it believes are not in compliance, and then they have 30 days to cure uh, whatever alleged problem they have. And the AG said that 75% of businesses complied within those 30 days. And of those last 25%, most were either still in their 30-day uh, window. And uh, for the others, there was an investigation going on. And uh, again, virtually every aspect of CCPA uh, was covered. So, you know, they sent letters to people who um, allegedly had problems with children's privacy, who didn't have two request methods, you know, one being a phone number um, for a lot of businesses. Um, so every part of CCPA was touched. Uh, so it's not like, you know, they're focusing on just one or two big parts of just your privacy notice. It's uh, really everything. And uh, the Attorney General also released a tool for uh, California residents to alert the Attorney General that, hey, I think this company might be violating the CCPA. So uh, that might also be helping them um, look for uh, other companies to go after. And then uh, the CPRA, uh, which is um, the uh, voter, uh, sorry, ballot initiative that voters approved at the very end of 2020, but uh, everyone's been now preparing for it, um, significantly amends the CCPA. And one of the biggest things it does is creating the California Privacy Protection Agency, uh, CPPA. We really, you know, need to fix all these acronyms that sound the same, but it's not much we can do, I'm afraid. Um, and the CPPA, the agency, will uh, be required to issue a lot of regulations uh, coming up. So we'll look about that, look at that in the future. And one other thing to note with the CPRA, uh, if you're hoping that maybe you know it gets amended to you know lessen some of businesses' burdens under the law, uh, it can't be because it's a ballot initiative. Um, the 
uh, CPRA, the law can only be amended to further the purpose and intent of the law. You can't you know, take out or weaken requirements generally. And so the CPPA uh, was created this last year. Um, there are five members of it appointed by the governor and various other state politicians. Uh, they're you know, law, law professors, um, members of industry and think tanks and things. They, uh, this last year, hired Ashkan Sultani uh, as their executive director, who has been a privacy advocate, worked at the FTC on privacy. Um, if you want to read about 900 pages of public comments, uh, you can uh, click on that link when we send out the slides, and uh, you can read, you know, how Google uh, suggested they look at regulations uh, down to, you know, Chamber of Commerce, small businesses, uh, they got a lot of public comments. And this is just asking in general, what types of things should we be considering when we regulate? They haven't issued actual draft regulations, they just kind of asked hey, as background, what do you all think? So um, they haven't begun their formal rulemaking. Uh, they're going to hold informational meetings, but not yet scheduled. Um, they have a very tight uh, schedule. They're supposed to finish uh, their regulations and issue them by this July. Um, I think practically speaking, that's almost certainly not going to happen by that time, but they're definitely working hard. And um, hopefully sooner rather than later, we will actually get to see the mini regulations that they're issuing. Now moving into the future, 2022, what are we expecting in California? The uh, timeline here, just to remind everyone, the CPRA is coming up quick. I feel like when we're in 2021, 2023 sounded a little bit far away. Now that we're in 2022, even though it's just a month later, I feel like you know, people are saying, oh yeah, that's sooner than I thought. So um, definitely something you need to be preparing for now. Um, enforcement does begin six months after the CPRA goes into effect in July 2023, um, although they can enforce violations that uh, happened all the way back to the beginning of 2023. Then uh, the CPRA, uh, here's a brief overview of kind of some of the changes. Uh, we have a bunch of tweaks, so some definitions were changed. Um, the law applies if you have 100,000 customers instead of just 50,000, some things like that. The two biggest tweaks I've listed are um, the ones with bolded and their sales. Uh, under the CPRA, CCPA, sorry, the original CCPA, only sales were regulated, um, whereas the CPRA coming into effect in 2023 regulates both sales and sharing of personal information. We'll get into a little bit more about that. And then the enforcement uh, is uh, done not just by the Attorney General now, but especially by the CPPA, the California Privacy Protection Agency. Again, sorry about the acronyms. Um, and then there are a few new things. Uh, there's a new category called sensitive uh, personal information. Uh, it uh, requires uh, data minimization, um, says no dark patterns. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the CPPA has to issue a lot of regulations, but especially on AI, uh, risk assessments, annual cybersecurity audits, and how business to business uh, personal information will be handled. So. A lot going on. Again, this is a brief overview in this slide. For a lot of these slides, we've done kind of a whole webinar on. So uh, these are all very high level, but uh, hopefully at least raise questions if you're saying, hey, that might be us, you know, things to look into. Then um, the CPRA will briefly talk about the consumer rights that have been added or uh, changed. There's now a right to request correction, which there isn't in the CCPA, the current law. Um, so now a uh, um, consumer can say, hey, this information you have about me is wrong. You're required to go in and fix it, generally speaking. Um, again, uh, you can now opt out of sharing personal information, not just selling. And that was specifically targeted at uh, behavioral advertising. So there were debates under the CCPA if you, know, you share with Google or Facebook people's personal information just so that Google or uh, Facebook can serve ads to them. Uh, you're not, you know, selling the personal information. You're not really getting uh, anything particularly uh, of value or money. But uh, the a lot of people were concerned about that, regardless. So sharing basically is sharing personal information for the purpose of cross-context behavioral advertising. 
whether or not you get money or something. And the, uh, I think, key thing there is that it's cross-context behavioral advertising. So if you're, you know, if someone is on your site and looking at, you know, the onesies you sell and you say, oh, hey, you might like these slippers too, uh, just based on what they're doing on your own website, you know, that's fine. But if you're allowing companies to, you know, track people across sites, um, that can be something that people might be able to opt out of. Um, the one other thing I'll note on this slide is that the right to know has a longer look back. Under the CCPA, you're technically only required to uh, provide information going back a year. And uh, now under the CPRA, it will be anything collected as of about a week and a half ago. So um, no uh, definite time limit there. The next few slides are ones that, uh, because of time, I won't go into. Um, as I mentioned, there's sensitive personal information now, and consumers have the right to limit uh, that use and uh, disclosure of that information, which if you want to learn more about, you can read that when we send those out. Same thing with AI. Um, that will be something that the agency is going to be um, looking at and issuing regulations on. We might be able to uh, learn a little bit more uh, about this based on what Virginia and Colorado have done, but um, it'll be a question mark. Dark patterns, as I mentioned, are prohibited. Basically, user interface things that uh, encourage people to choose things that aren't as privacy protective. Um, and then there's also the cybersecurity audits and risk assessments, which um, we assume will probably be like the many other jurisdictions that require them, but we won't know until the CPPA issues its regulations. So I think that does it for California. Question. Sorry. Yeah, no, please. We had a question come in uh, that I, I wanted to address a little bit with you if you have um, uh, some thoughts on it. So uh, one of the questions was to address how this will impact service providers, the changes coming through the CPRA. And one of the things that I was thinking about was the fact that we're now looking at the opt-out rights for not just the sharing of the selling of data, but also for the sharing of data. From my perspective, that's probably going to be the biggest change impacting service providers. But I, I was wondering if you wanted to comment on that specifically or on other things that you think will really have an impact on service providers. Yeah, I think that expanded right to opt out, um, not just for sales, but for sharing, as you say, will be something. Uh, there's uh, also uh, some new requirements um, on a previous slide we briefly mentioned that there is now reasonable security requirements for all personal information. Before it was only a certain subset of personal information that uh, you now had an affirmative duty to take reasonable security uh, protections against. And now that's for all personal information. So that's broader and definitely could be something where companies are going to be requiring uh, service providers to make representations and contracts about the security measures that they provide so that the uh, controller, the business can affirmatively say, yeah, we're taking good steps to protect information. Um, so those are the main things that come to mind. Yeah, I think those are great points. And, and I think especially with um, talking about the look back right to 2022, uh, other things that are, you need to be doing in 2022, I, I think are, you know, getting your service provider contracts um, in place if you don't already have them in place, because there are going to be, you know, uh, there's more need now, right? For those to be um, not just up to date, but also to provide for things like taking care of the security needs around all of the data. So I think that's a, a great point that you made. Thanks. Absolutely. And so I think I will hand it over to uh, William, who can talk about Virginia and Colorado. Thank you, Austin. So yeah, so Virginia and Colorado, these jurisdictions or states have the most similarity out of all the jurisdictions we'll be talking about today. Um, and so when I get into differences, it'll probably really get into the weeds, but just bear with me. So first we'll be examining um, you know, the past, what has happened. Well, both laws were passed last year. Uh, Virginia was first to pass theirs in um, early 2021, and it will go in effect January 1st, 2023, where Colorado passed theirs later that summer, and subsequently will go in effect July 1st, 2023. I'll first be looking at what businesses or who is covered um, by these laws. 
So this is both states are very similar. Um, any business who intentionally produces or delivers products or services to these states residents and and they break them off into two categories, the first being the same for both states. Um, the controller processes personal data of 100,000 of the state's residents. So if you have if you do that, then you qualify in both states. Um, the other way that you can qualify, and this differs between both states differently, is if you process 25,000 of their respective residents. And for Colorado, if any of that data is then, that personal data is then sold, then the law applies to you. Virginia defines it much more narrowly where uh, not only you have to sell, but the revenue you get from selling it has to be 50%, has to be over 50% of your gross revenue for the law to apply for you. But like everything else, um, there's always exceptions and we'll be looking at that next. So the similarities here, and I'm mentioning that I, these are not all the carve outs. They both spend about a page on their laws going over what carve outs there are. These are just the high levels and the ones that apply to most people. Um, they both exclude higher education and employment records. Uh, Virginia excludes nonprofits where Colorado includes. So if you're a nonprofit and the law applies to you for Virginia, you're fine. But if it's for Colorado, then you have to comply. Uh, the other major difference is that for HIPAA and Graham Acts, uh, for Virginia, if the law applies to, you know, if HIPAA or Graham apply to your organization, then your whole organization is exempt, where for Colorado, only the data that that law applies to. So again, Virginia here is being much more broader um, in their exemption, where Colorado is being much more narrow. And Virginia is the odd one out um, if you're looking at a larger picture. Uh, next, we'll be looking at uh, what kind of data is covered or what, you know, what personal data means. Uh, and again, this is the same for each state. It's any information that is linked or is reasonably linkable to an identified or identifiable individual or natural person. Reason for the difference on the end there is one state uses individual, the other one uses natural person. And we haven't really seen a difference in application for that. Uh, so in all intents and purposes, it's the same. Again, carve outs include de-identified data and publicly available information. And the laws go into detail on what those are. Subcategories of personal data are pseudonymous data. This is just data that will have fewer obligations and then sensitive, sensitive data, which will have more obligations of what you need. I could spend a ton of time talking about um, both, but I'll only be talking about sensitive data today. So with sensitive data, they're actually, their definitions are far more similar than the slide may make you think. Um, you know, they personal data re, re, data revealing racial or ethnic origins, religious beliefs, the things that kind of you think of um, that are similar to other jurisdictions, uh, data to collection from a known child. Uh, the biggest difference is the precise geologic, geolocation data that Virginia includes on theirs. Uh, Colorado does not mention that. The other definite differences I've pointed out here are underlined, and it's just simply that Colorado adds some additional words to what Virginia Virginia has, and then, you know, for example, Virginia uses immigration status, Colorado uses citizenship status. Again, nothing really seemed going to be changed going forward, but as anybody who knows an attorney, we like to find nitty gritty details, and so only time will tell. Uh, one way that sensitive data becomes important is the need to do a data protection assessment. So the data protection assessment, I won't go into big details, but you've got five types of data that you could do that you will need to do data protection and sensitive data is just one of them. And again, this is exactly the same thing for each state, except for the definitions. However, I don't think the definitions will be all super important, those little nuances, uh, because of point five, it's just anything with heightened risk. And so, you know, those nuances probably will fall into those lines. So if you have to do an assessment in one state, you'll have to do it in another. On our next slide, I just go over um, what is required and what happens with those assessments, but I won't be diving into that now. Next, we'll have the consumer rights. And again, for all intents and purposes, exact same for each state. The only time we get into a difference 
is you're required to allow for an appeal and just the days on that appeal period are different. And then our next slide for enforcement, I'm just gonna point out that both states have no private right of action and therefore the attorney general is the only one who can enforce it. Um, and they all have a period of time where, you know, when the attorney general comes up and says, you have a problem that you can cure it. So that concludes our past. So that all the, the everything that was passed and then looking forward, just that some, we're looking, I'll just identify some key dates and then what we can expect for like rulemaking uh, from each of the states. Uh, on this slide, William, yes, go ahead. Sorry, I'm monitoring the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I'm just rolling like a steamroller here. So thanks yeah, for stopping. No, this is great. There's so much information and we're trying to get it all out there. Um, but one thing I did wanna note, um, when you were talking about sensitive data and precise geolocation, um, somebody was like, well, what does that mean? And it means almost the same thing in every jurisdiction, which is a third of a mile, or um, for those jurisdictions not using mileage, uh, 1,750 feet. <laughs> so- um, Very precise on what precise is. Very precise about what does precise mean. So um, if you are tracking people that closely, maybe you're doing geofencing or something to figure out who's going in and out of certain buildings that for some reason like click, you know, would trigger a marketing response from your team or that kind of thing. That's where you, you might need to, to adjust your activities. Yes, precisely. Sorry for that interruption. No, again, feel free because I'll, I'll steamroll and I won't see you until you yell at me. So thank you for that. Uh, for key dates, uh, just pointing out here that you know, unlike with California, the effective date and the enforcement date are the same date. So the day it comes into force, enforced, you know, for Virginia, January 1st, 2023 is the same day it can start being enforced. So you have to make sure that you're in compliance by these dates uh, for Virginia you know, January, and then for Colorado, July. And again, these dates, as we've kind of seen, will get here faster than you have uh, you would think. Next, we're gonna do uh, Colorado's future rulemaking. There is no current movement on this yet, hence why it's in the future section. Uh, the law simply gives the attorney general the ability to adopt some rules and then requires that they adopt at least one due to a, uh, to deal with a universal opt out. Uh, next. For Virginia, they kept rulemaking with themselves with the uh, General Assembly or their legislative branch. And so um, instead, they appointed a working group that reported or finished in November and will report during this current legislative session. Um, and just to kind of identify from the public what may they may or may not change and on my next slide i'd identify some of those points i just want to remind everybody these are just recommendations um you kind of can view them as like a comment period where they can they may or may not actually implement and some of the areas deal with enforcement definition and rights but again these are just you know some of them and you i provided a link in the sl previous slide if you would like to read the whole thing so that covers virginia and colorado and so next we'll i'll give it over to marie Thanks, William and Austin, to both of you. So we've uh, done a pretty deep dive on our U.S. jurisdictions. Now I'm going to uh, move us towards the, the international perspective. And so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what we saw happen in the EU last year. Uh, so some of you will be very familiar with this already and others. Um, this may be the moment where you're like, we're not selling anywhere else. We're not looking anywhere else. I'm going to um, get something to drink. Totally get Yeah. Uh, but in the EU last year, um, the most important thing that happened happened in June, which was the European Data Protection Bureau, the EDPB, adopted its final rec recommendations on what are referred to as supplementary measures. Um, supplementary measures are essentially the things that we have to do to make our data processing compliant with the SHRMS 2 court case, with the outcome in that case. And so essentially what happened was the court said, look, um, just having you know, the right contracts in place, we've determined isn't really enough because you might have the right contracts in place, but be processing data, like where you take data from, you know, somebody who's in the EU and you export it to a third country that's not inside either the EU or the EEA, the European Economic Area. You take it somewhere like the US, for example, and we can't guarantee that the contract will be honored if, you know, say US law enforcement says they want to look at that data and even though you know they're supposed to meet all these requirements under your contract, 
we can't really guarantee it. So what we need is we need to, to do additional things to protect the data. Those measures um, are addressed in the new SCCs, um, these supplementary measures. So we got the, the final recommendations on those and we also got the new SCCs just a few days later. So um, we have a lot of guidance about what needs to be done to comply with the requirements of SHRM 2. And we also have new standard contractual clauses. And the standard contractual clauses, um, again, if you're not familiar, those are the contracts that you need to put in place between um, the two parties. If, if you're exporting data out of the EU and into a third country that's either outside of the EU and the EEA, or for example, it's going to a third country that doesn't have an adequacy decision from the EU. So most of the time, you know, if you're transferring data to the US, if you're transferring data to um, somewhere in Latin America, if you're transferring data to India, um, these are places where you would need the SECs in place. Um, and so because we have new SECs from the EU, uh, we also have timelines on when you have to stop using the old ones. So if you and your service provider entered into the old SCCs, um, you can keep using that same agreement up until uh, December of this year. Um, you can't enter into any new agreements using them at this point though. Um, as of September, any new agreements had to start using the new SCCs. So if you're still using the old SCCs, stop and start using the new ones. Um, so. Uh, that's sort of where we are in terms of the major changes that happened in the EU in 2021. And then we have the changes that happened outside of the EU because the UK is no longer part of the EU. So Brexit happened in 2020, um, but then we had a transition period all through 2020 where things got to pretty much stay the same while they figured out what the rules would be. Um, so last year, um, we had the end of the transition period and an adequacy decision. So an adequacy decision means that um, the EU has recognized the data protection laws in the UK as being strong enough to allow for essentially the free flow of information between the two countries. Um, so you can you know, trans transfer information out of the EU and into the UK, and the UK also issued an ad adequacy decision for the EU. So you can also transfer from the UK back to the EU. Um, so that's good news if you're transferring data um, between those two uh, regions, um, but it doesn't get you quite all the way there because um, with the UK now being out on its own in data privacy land, it means that they have their own data privacy laws. So the very uniquely named UK GDPR um, governs if you're transferring, um, if you're processing any information about people in the UK, if you're exporting it from the UK to another country. Um, and so you now have to be compliant with the UK's GDPR, which essentially mirrors the EU's, but because it is a separate jurisdiction, it means you have to do some things twice. Uh, so uh, UK is back to being on its own um, in terms of data protection, um, because the transition period's over, that's the biggest thing to know. You can keep using the old SECs for UK data transfers because they have not yet issued their own SCCs. Um, but we're gonna uh, talk about that more in a minute. And so what is happening? What, what's the future for the EU and the UK? Um, the most important thing I would say is that you need to be aware of what do I do in the future with data I'm trying to transfer out of the UK. Like I said, we're still using the old EU SCCs to transfer data out of the UK. So service providers, exporters, um, they need these um, old SCCs to be executed to be the governing contracts. Um, but the, the UK has proposed what they call the International Data Transfer Agreement, which would replace the SCCs. So we got a new acronym, yay, but it does the same thing. The IDTA, um, when passed, uh, will replace the SECs and you'll start having to use the IDTA between parties if you want to transfer information out of the UK. Um, it's supposed to go to Parliament sometime early this year, so hopefully that means Q1 because it would be nice to have some certainty. Um, and there's some differences, so prepare to start doing a few things a little bit differently once the IDTA is approved officially. Um, so basically, uh, if you have an IDTA in place, 
um, you may, and this is the nice thing, you may be allowed uh, to just use the SECs from another jurisdiction. So essentially the UK has said, look, we get that at this stage, everybody has their own version. Mm. And so if you already have one in place, um, that's maybe approved by the EU, for example, we might just let you do an addendum about the UK. So that would be really nice. That would be the easiest thing we've seen come out of all these conflicting jurisdictions. Um, it's not totally clear how that would work on an operational um, stage, but again, it, it suggests that it would be a, at least somewhat easier. Um, you also though will need to do a transfer risk assessment, um, which is called a transfer impact assessment in the EU, they're the same thing. Um, again, this is the outcome of SHREMS 2, where you have to look at the jurisdictions that you're sending the data to and um, do an impact assessment for what will happen with the data there. Uh, so the goals of both the EU and the UK for this year and the future are um, to become compliant with the requirements of that court case of SHRMS 2. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, thanks. Um, so what are some of the other differences we might see between the UK and the EU this year with that IDTA? Um, one is that the, U the EU's new SCCs explicitly confirm that they fulfill the requirements of Article 28 in the GDPR. The old SECs didn't do that. It was a gap that they've now filled. Um, interestingly, although that gap has been identified in the EU already, the IDTA won't satisfy Article 28 explicitly, um, but we think it can get there. <laughs> we, we think it can get there. It just won't be as explicit, as clear as, as we're seeing with the EU. Um, the IDTA basically suggests that um, it's only the exporter that's going to be required to do any transfer um, risk assessments or transfer impact assessments, depending on which language you prefer, um, which would be uh, easier from the perspective of the parties if only one party has to do it. Um, under the EU, uh, both the exporter and the importer are expected to carry out these assessments. So that would be probably one of the biggest differences between the two. Um, there's a few other smaller ones um, that uh, I don't think will have that much uh, impact overall in terms of how organizations have to um, plan their, their privacy compliance for the, the EU and the UK. Um, one of them might uh, change your timing, which is the IDTA will require um, contractual, contractually um, that you review your IDTAs uh, more often than is explicitly required by the EU's SECs. So if you're trying to keep everything on the same cadence, you might start reviewing your, your SCCs on the same uh, schedule that you're reviewing your IDTAs. Um, so is that enough acronyms? <laughs> I'm so sorry, it, it gets like really weedy here when you're talking about privacy law. So main things that companies need to do to adapt. First of all, if you're exporting data, um, if, you know, if you're being governed by both the EU and the UK, and you don't have offices, in those um, regions, you do need to appoint a representative and you need a separate representative. In the past, you know, a, somebody in the UK could be a representative in the EU as well, but because of Brexit, that's no longer true. So you may need to appoint new representatives. And um, also, if the, if the UK used to be your supervisory authority um, for the EU, uh, that's no longer the case. So you may need to identify a new lead supervisory, supervisory authority for your activities in the EU. Uh, you also need to update your contracts. Obviously, if you're in the EU, uh, you've got to get those new SECs in place. If you have the old ones, um, you're, you're fine for the majority of this year, but by December 27th, you have to have new ones in place with um, the parties that you're uh, transferring data to or receiving data from. Uh, and then, you know, once we get the IDTA from the UK, we'll have some deadlines for getting those in place. Uh, and then, also just you know policies procedures and other documentation in light of all of these changes you know they need to be reviewed so for example if you're a 650 customer uh, you need to go in and review make sure you've updated your documents since the um, push that we did with the um, document update for you know the new SECs and the uh, attendant requirements so those are those are the main things that you need to do to get ready in both the EU and the UK so now I'm going to transition us to China. So what happened last year in China? 
It was fun. It was fast. So in August, China announced their new privacy law, which would go into effect on November 1st. So it was a really quick turnaround. Um, the, the PIPL um, went into effect on November 1st. The most fun thing about the PIPL uh, is that it required a transfer mechanism to export data, but it did not provide any that were approved. So um, if you're kind of new to the space, the idea of transfer mechanisms, when I was talking about the SECs and the IDTA for the EU and the UK, those are transfer mechanisms. They're um, things that you can rely on to verify the legality of the exporting of data. So, um, you know, if a country has been recognized by the EU as having adequate data protection laws, um, you could transfer data there without a contract between you and the other party. If they haven't done that, um, you need one of these contracts in place where you verify that certain things will be done to protect the information. So the same idea in China. Uh, China's law was modeled very closely off of the GDPR in a lot of ways. Um, but the interesting thing is China said, look, we can, you, we, we can specifically say that you can transfer data somewhere. We can approve a specific you know, transfer by your company, like if you submit it to our um, cyberspace authority, or you can um, have an approved contract with standardized clauses. But they didn't actually make any of those things available. <laughs> so um, a lot of companies are doing stopgap measures in the interim. Um, while we while we wait for some standardized contracts to contract clauses to come out of China, um, what does the law do? The Chinese privacy law covers organizations that are either inside of China, handling the personal information of individuals that are inside of China's borders, or it also covers organizations that are outside of China that are handling the personal information of people who are inside of China, if. Uh, the purpose of that data handling is to either provide goods or services to people in China. So if your organization is, say, in the U.S., it's in India, it's in, you know, whatever other country, and you're selling goods and services to people in China, and so you're processing their data, it, it, you know, at corporate headquarters or wherever, um, the law applies to you. Uh, it also applies if you're outside of China but handling um, the PI of Chinese individuals, if you're doing it to analyze or assess their assess their activities. So say, you know, you're not selling anything in China yet, but you're um, trying to decide if you're going to move there. So you're trying to get a good assessment of, um, you know, what the market looks like, what kinds of things are people buying or, or whatever it is. Um, the law would apply to you as well, because you're um, handling the information for the purpose of analyzing the activities of Chinese individuals. And then we have a big catch-all, which uh, is really fun. Uh, it could also apply if, uh, you're outside of China, but you're handling Chinese data for um, pretty much any other reason that they come up with in a future regulation or find an existing regulation to say, oh yeah, so it applies to you too. Um, and this is one of the main differences we see between uh, the Chinese regulation and the EU's GDPR. So although China mirrors GDPR in a lot of ways, um, they did provide for some broader authority of government. You know, EU tries to keep government out of people's mm -hmm. data uh, China just sort of says, well, we're going to provide some space for ourselves if we need it later. Uh, so, so that's one of the big differences. And then, um, you know, what information is covered? So when we say personal information, what do they include in that for China? Um, so basically, it's the same definition that you see coming out of the GDPR for the most part. Um, you know, any information, however it's recorded, whether it's electronic or otherwise, so like hard copy information counts too. Um, if it's related to identified or identifiable natural persons, um, and it, but it does not include any information after it's been anonymized. So when you first collect information, it may be covered, um, but if you then process the information to anonymize it, once it's been anonymized, um, the regulation no longer applies to it. Uh, and then we also have, like with the other jurisdictions, particularly the ones William was talking about, um, sensitive information being treated differently with extra protections. Um, it's really similar to definitions we see coming out of other countries, um, but it, it does have some differences. Um, one thing that is really interested, interesting um, is that it, it talks about it's, in addition to the things that are specifically identified, it's any personal information that if leaked or used illegally could easily cause harm to what they call the dignity of persons or to the security of their um, property. 
their person or their property. So the property thing is new. We haven't seen that in other um, privacy regulations really. Mm. So that, that was an interesting one that I just thought I would call out. Um, so that's the information that's covered. So what does that mean for us in China and now and into the future? Uh, essentially what it means is that we're really, really excited to see SCCs. <laughs> we can't wait for them because until then, pretty much everybody who's transferring information out of China is doing it um, with some risk. You know, people are still engaging in business. They're still doing what they need to do, but technically they're probably doing it illegally, technically. <laughs> So um, enforcement's likely to begin, I think, once we have those SCCs. Um, and we, we should also see reg additional regulations coming out of China. The Cyberspace Administration is specifically authorized in the law to issue regulations around certain areas that they're actually required to issue more regulations around. Um, so essentially, um, additional regulations around extraterritoriality so um, we have sort of the generalities of this is when it applies to you, even if you're not in China, um, but we're expecting to see more specific guidance there. Um, also around lawful bases for processing data um, and for transferring the PI out of China. So like I said, that's the biggest one. Um, we, we really need it. Uh, we have stopgap measures in place um, until then. So you can put like a data processing agreement in place that accounts for the requirements of the law, but technically, it won't have been approved by the Cyberspace Administration because they haven't approved anything yet. Um, so those are probably the biggest things. Um, there are also DPO requirements in the Chinese law. So uh, if you are um, a high level data processor, um, it's likely that you're gonna meet those requirements and need a DPO. Uh, and then lastly, uh, but, but I say it's likely, but we haven't seen specific recs so we're waiting for those specific regulations. Uh, so, so that's probably like sort of the, the highlights of what we'll be doing in China and waiting for. Um, like I said, uh, I think once they get the SECs in place, we'll probably see a lot of enforcement from China. But until then, I do think enforcement will probably be light. So that's my prognostication for the year. Uh, and, and with that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Austin, who is going to take us back to the U.S., um, to talk uh, at a broader level, so beyond just what um, has already happened uh, at the, the federal level and in some other states that we haven't talked about. And so he's going to sort of like broaden the scope. So Austin, take it away. Absolutely. Thanks. So uh, looking to the past in 2021 at the federal level, not much happened, um, at least not, you know, as far as comprehensive consumer privacy laws or regulations, uh, the types of things that have happened in California, Virginia, and Colorado. Um, this is probably a little bit harsh to say, you know, nothing at all happened. The FTC continued to enforce some privacy, um, especially around children's privacy and things. But um, for the broad types of legislation and regulation uh, that we're focusing on here, the federal government uh, really didn't do much um, of anything in the last year. Going forward uh, in 2022 and beyond, uh, there are definitely a few things to keep an eye on at the federal level. There's always the possibility that Congress will actually act and uh, pass a law that regulates uh, comprehensive consumer privacy. Um, one of the hurdles there is whether uh, doing so would preempt laws like the CCPA, CPRA, and Virginia's and Colorado's laws, or would this kind of set a floor that states could add more requirements on? Um, then there's the private right of action uh, for some privacy uh, advocates and privacy sent, uh, concerned members of Congress. Uh, the private right of action letting individual consumers sue is popular. Um, what the penalties and enforcement will be. Um, facial recognition and AI is really a third rail. And, um, you know, anything uh, required beyond kind of the basic consumer rights. Those are some things that need to be ironed out and uh, just make it so that I'm not uh, particularly um, rosy uh, view on whether Congress will actually pass something this year, but sometimes it just comes out of the blue and happens. And I will say that the more states that have been passing laws like Virginia and Colorado, in addition to California, 
and um, as we'll talk about in a second, FTC regulation, that definitely puts more pressure on Congress to act. A lot of businesses um, and uh, think tanks and uh, you know chambers of commerce and things will be pressuring Congress to do something about the patchwork that's developing um, around state law. Even if they're not you know, completely contradictory or anything, uh, it definitely uh, imposes some headaches. So going uh, away from Congress, the FTC actually uh, is poised to do more um, in 2022 and beyond. At the very end of last year, they announced that they are basically considering <laughs> uh, issuing privacy and AI regulations. And the three things they said they would be trying to do would be to curb lax security practices, limit privacy abuses, and ensure that AI does not result in unlawful discrimination. So um, again, this is an announcement of possible rulemaking. So it's you know not officially started, but they're definitely very interested in it. Um, last year, a new uh, chair of the FTC uh, was appointed who's very privacy conscious. The one kind of buzzword to know around this, um, if you're at a cocktail party and someone brings up FTC rulemaking around privacy, as so often happens, uh, the Magnuson Moss procedures are what the FTC has to go through uh, when it's issuing regulations. And those are somewhat more burdensome than other agencies have to go through, which is one of the reasons why in 2022, it's highly unlikely that final regulations uh, would come out. Um, in addition to this, initial notice of potential uh, rulemaking that they issued uh, last year, um, which is technically going into effect in February this year. Um, they then have to notify Congress if they're going to start rulemaking, and then there's always the notice and comment period and things like that. So Magnuson Moss um, is the buzzword here that um, makes it a little bit more difficult for the FTC to actually issue these regulations, but um, it is definitely considering them. Then uh, just kind of going broad picture again to state privacy legislation. Last year, uh, Washington, Ohio, Florida, DC, New York um, were some of the big states that uh, considered privacy legislation along the lines of California, Virginia, and Colorado. A lot of other states have also introduced bills and they've had varying degrees of success. Um, Washington, I believe passed one, uh, House of their Congress and was close in the other. And that law has been reintroduced this year. Um, and, you know, uh, the fact that two states passed the legislation last year might indicate that there's momentum and two or more might pass it this year. The uh, other thing to note here is there seems to be somewhat of a consensus forming. While uh, William talked about the differences between Virginia and Colorado, there were also a lot of similarities there. And uh, the Washington bill would basically take uh, the California law and things included in Virginia and Colorado's. So things like consumer rights, contractual requirements, um, assessments for risk assessments for certain kinds of processing information. Uh, no private right of action uh, has been very popular so far. So that is looking less and less likely that that would be included in any legislation. So uh, just to thing to keep your eye on is that it's very possible that another state or two this year could pass uh, privacy legislation that will um, also add to um, your or other companies' uh, burdens. So that could be fun. And I think uh, that about covers it uh, for what we wanted to talk about. Marie, are there any other uh, questions or issues we wanted to Yes, um, we have a number of questions in the q and I was actually just typing an answer to one of them. Instead, maybe I'll talk about it for a second because there are actually two um, questions, three, I think, that are actually all related to it. Um, someone was asking uh, if we could talk about um, how companies should change their SEC negotiations in light of the Austrian decision in the Google Analytics case. Uh, so for those who haven't um, seen anything about the case or, or don't have a lot of information about it, uh, just so you know, essentially that case uh, was one in which Google, uh, Google Analytics um, did put in place some supplementary measures and have been using SECs um, as the uh, 
as a transfer mechanism for um, its data practices uh, for exporting data. Um, and the determination by um, the court there, uh, was, or by the supervisory authority there, uh, was that supplementary measures are only considered effective. So these are the measures you take in addition to just putting the contracts in place um, if you're transferring the data to a third country. Um, they're only considered effective if they address the specific deficiencies that you identify in the third country's data protection um, scheme. Uh, so essentially the, the data protection method that Google Analytics had put in place, which in this situation, what they were talking about specifically was um, encryption. Um, it was encryption at rest. Uh, they found that that supplementary measure did not effectively address um, one of the deficiencies, which was um, access and surveillance uh, by US intelligence services. So um, it's, it's really interesting because we haven't really seen the operational fallout of that yet, um, but it does suggest that you, know, you can't only rely on um, single measures for sure, um, but you also need to make that connection between the measures you're taking and the, um, the deficiencies that you've identified. So if you're doing a transfer risk assessment or a transfer impact assessment, TIA, TRA, depending on if you're talking about the UK or the EU, um, you need to make sure that those risks that you've identified are the risks that you're solving for when you take those supplementary measures. Um, so again, like just what would be enough, we don't know yet. Uh, I think uh, honestly what the EU is trying to do is force some of this federal action so, so that we have you know, a regime that they can look at and say like, okay, this is what the US can and can't do. And it's gonna be the same everywhere. You know, California is much more protective than anywhere else. But you know, companies like Google Analytics need to be able to rely on a, a federal scheme, not just a state-by-state -state patchwork. So, um, so I, I thought that was maybe one that would be helpful for everybody to hear about. Uh, but I also think it might be helpful, um, Austin and William, if you want to comment on um, having just done like this intensive review of U.S. privacy law, like what do you see as being the the biggest um, or the most important steps that companies should place, you know, at the front end of what they're going to do in 2022 to protect privacy in the U.S. Yeah, um, great question. I think um, the basic answer is almost always in these situations: data mapping, figuring out again what you have, who it's being shared with, who at your company is using it and collecting it, where they're storing it, even in the cloud, things like that. Um, is always more surprising than you might think. Um, if you did initial data mapping a year or two ago for the CCPA, it might be time to go back to different departments in the company and make sure those are fully accurate still. And especially with um, California and soon Virginia and Colorado allowing broader opt-out rights, um, it's not just selling personal information anymore uh, that is the big question in California. Um, it's now sharing for cross-context behavioral advertising as well. So um, even if you've done a great data map, um, if it was focused on um, you know, whether you sell information, uh, you will need to go back and make sure that you're covering sharing as defined in those laws. And I think the other thing is uh, risk impact assessments. Um, both Virginia and Colorado officially require impact assessments for using sensitive data for certain uses of AI, things like that. And the CPPA will be issuing regulations that will certainly require them in uh, at least some probably very similar circumstances. So getting your head wrapped around what an impact assessment is, um, how you need to go about balancing all of the risks and benefits and things, um, is something that you should start looking at now so that uh, you can have them ready when a regulator asks beginning in 2023. Um, we do offer tools for doing that type of thing, uh, whether you use ours or develop your own templates or things like that. Um, risk assessments are definitely something that uh, companies will need to start looking into. Yeah, Austin. Austin kind of stole the big one for me is, yeah, just know what you're doing with your data, because as we saw with these laws, a lot of it is dependent on, you know, what you're doing and and the quantity. And, and unless you actually look at what's going on with your data, you can't 
for sure say where it falls and which jurisdiction you have to comply to, let alone all the additional things that come with it. So the first thing would be, you know, understand your data because it's, you know, this hopefully seems complicated as it is because we just barely touched on a lot of these issues. And looking into the future, as we can see, it's only going to get more complicated. And the only, you know, the first step into getting your hands around it, I think is definitely understanding what's happening with your data. And then also just knowing some basic numbers, uh, because otherwise you can't do that. And then second would be, you know, because again, I don't want to just, just restate what Austin said, is getting help, whether it's like having somebody inside your company who just spends significant time knowing this, whether it's outside counsel, whether it's using our tool, again, it doesn't really matter what you use, but this is complicated enough that you're anywhere close to getting, you know, falling in one jurisdiction, you know, you're, it's likely going to have a domino effect that you're going to fall into other jurisdictions as well. And and having like being thrown into this pretty recently, it's a complicated field and any help you can get is, is, you know, very good. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, if you guys have the same ideas about what's most important, I think that really drives home how important it is. Um, but uh, I'll also just follow up on that and answer one more question that was in the Q&A. I know we're at time, so if you have to leave, totally fine. Um, but one question that was asked was whether these rules are just about uh, application for your technology department at your company, or if they're also applicable to um, HRIS, to your human resources side. Um, and I'll go ahead and, and just sort of answer that and say, um, it's applicable to everything. So um, it's not just what's happening uh, in your um, tech side or on your website, it's all of the data, all of the personal information that your company is processing, no matter how you got it, um, all of these laws apply to it. Now there are some exemptions in US law. So in US law, if you're looking say at, at California, for example, um, your human resources data is not subject to um, data privacy requests. So you know one of your employees or an ex-employee or you know, an, applicant, an applicant can't say to you, hey, delete my information. But they do have notice rights. They, they, their data is still governed by the law. They have the right to notice about what you're collecting about them, what you're doing with it, who you're sharing it with. Um, and they also, if, if you do have um, you know, a data breach, they also have rights um, uh, to you know, bring a suit if they choose to, um, if there's a data breach that causes them harm. So you still have um, requirements in the law about what you do with that data, um, but, uh, but, but not all of it applies in California. Um, so EU, China, it applies to everything, HR data, website data, in-person data, anything you have, it applies. Um, US, there's these exemptions for employment data, but you do still need to make sure that you're meeting all, any of your notice and other requirements. Um, so with that, the takeaway that I wanna give you is, um, Kind of following up on Williams, which is it, it's gotten to a stage where bootstrapping privacy is getting really hard to do. You know, if if you've been trying to do it without setting aside any investment dollars, if you know, if you already missed the budget meeting for 2022, like ask for ask for a, a rehearing um, because privacy is going to start getting more expensive, and not doing privacy the right way is also gonna get more expensive because we're gonna start seeing a lot more enforcement out of all of these jurisdictions.